Welcome to Reaching Out. I'm President Gregory Floyd, Local 237 Teamsters. Back with us again, our very special guest is Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance. Mr. District Attorney, welcome back to the show. Greg, thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We want to start with uh, a discussion about the caseload your offices now, um, I would say, prosecute. You have over 100,000 cases a year that you are responsible for adjudicating. How do you deal with that? It, first of all, a little background. You're absolutely right. The Manhattan DA's office is unlike any prosecutor's office in the country in terms of not just the number, which is over roughly 100,000, but the breadth, the variety, and complexity of cases that we handle. That 100,000 cases includes many of the cases you would typically think of a local district attorney's office, such as street crime, robbery, homicide, and sexual assault. But well beyond that, we have a huge devotion of resources to cybercrime uh, and to economic crimes, to organized crime and other kinds of uh, large-scale frauds. So it's a big job for about 500 assistants in our office. And we divide the office, Greg, into two large units, one dealing with what we call trial cases, the trial bureau. Uh, that principally deals with the volume of cases that come in from street arrests. And the Investigations Bureau deals with long, proactive investigations, much like you'd see in a federal prosecutor's office. And the second way we deal with it is well-trained assistants and good management of those well-trained assistants. The strength of a DA's office really lies in the strength of the lawyers and staff that you hire. And so our uh, a principal focus of any district attorney is to make sure that we are trying to, and succeeding in attracting good employees, good lawyers who have the right attitude toward prosecution, uh, and that can manage and lead this very big office. You mentioned cybercrime, and I know cybercrime is on the rise. Uh, that's um, the crimes uh, that involve computers. But another thing that we didn't uh, mention was cyberbullying among teenagers, the MySpace, the Facebook. <clears throat> Cyber, it, this is a very important issue. Uh, Oftentimes, cyberbullying doesn't rise to the level of a crime that our office has to prosecute. It can. There are crimes like harassment and stalking and uh, identity theft that can be part of cyberbullying. But cyberbullying, like cybercrime and identity theft, is much more prevalent than we'd like to admit. Our office is very aggressive in outreach and prevention uh, to young men and women in Manhattan to talk about the issues related to cyberbullying. There's some very tragic stories that we know about. There's some cases that are ongoing uh, in the local jurisdiction involving alleged cyberbullying that led to uh, suicide. That's not the first time that's happened, however. In other parts of the country, we also see that cyberbullying can have unintended and sometimes fatal consequences. Just last week, I was up in northern Manhattan uh, talking to high school students and later that afternoon down in uh, at Hedrick Martin uh, talking to a slightly older group. Basically, we have a presentations where we go out and we talk to kids about what is cyberbullying, uh, how does it happen, what are the consequences, uh, how significant those consequences can be, how painful they can be, and to make kids more aware of their responsibilities and the risks. So it's a it's, it's an issue that has captured the attention, and rightfully so, of parents and educators and the public at large, and that along with cybercrime, which is essentially any crime committed using the modern computer, is a huge part of the work that we're now doing. We have over 200, two to 300 new cases each month that come into our office from street arrests on identity theft, and we also have a unit of 10 lawyers that deal with long-term, proactive national and international cybercrime investigations. It's a big deal for us. Now, what is uh, some of the instructions, the advice, and the guidance that you give to the assistant district attorneys to handle cases? Is there any... Uh, well, well, first of all, there's, there, there's uh, training that goes along with many of the kinds, different kinds of cases that we handle. 
So we are our lawyers that deal with sex crimes cases, elder abuse, child abuse, cyber crime, economic fraud. They all have advice that's related to specific training. But fundamentally, Greg, the job of a district attorney uh, and, a dist and an assistant district attorney is to make sure that we try to do the right thing in every case, wherever that leads us, whether that means to aggressively prosecute, whether that means to arrive at an appropriate plea bargain, or to dismiss the case, as we do uh, from time to time if we feel the case doesn't have the evidence or shouldn't be prosecuted. So our message to the young assistants is uh, investigate carefully, but once you know the facts, do what you think is the right thing to do in that case. And ultimately, uh, our assistants have to be guided by their responsibilities as prosecutors, but also their moral compass and conscience. Now, we all know about the high, I would say, high public, uh, high publicity crimes. The high. What are some of the crimes that we don't hear about that are more difficult, the most difficult cases to prosecute? Well, let me give you one example of a case that was actually sentenced today. Uh, it was a case involving a, uh, an Upper East Side 73-year-old woman who was the victim of an attempted rape and a completed assault. Uh, her, uh, the man who attacked her was sentenced today to a substantial prison term. But there's a case where you have a regular citizen, uh, a case that's not going to receive much attention. Uh, it, uh, as many of these cases require lots of investigation. Sometimes they're solved by DNA. And then the thing that most people, I think, don't fully appreciate is how courageous these victims, particularly vulnerable victims and elderly victims and children and victims of domestic violence have to be to go down to court, tell their story to pro lawyers they don't know, police officers they don't know, sometimes to a grand jury, 23 citizens who they don't know, and then at the end, if there's a trial, to actually have to speak their story in a public courtroom, sometimes with the newspapers there, about what happened to them. And the victims are remarkably brave, as that 73-year-old woman was today, in a case that you won't hear about, but very typical of the kind of case that we deal with. Now, you also have some efforts to reach into the communities that do not involve enforcing the law and prosecuting. One of them is a basketball program that you mentioned prior when I met with you. Uh, can you tell us about that program and how it's going and how it's working? My, my job as DA is driven uh, by some very simple principles. And first of all, in terms of fighting crime, uh, I'm not just interested in counting convictions in a courtroom. Now, that's important. But ultimately, I think a prosecutor has to be interested in what are the strategies that we can use that are going to help drive crime down for the long term. And clearly, Greg, if we have strategies that are going to reach out to young kids, particularly at-risk kids, and offer them uh, a safe, for example, place to be on Friday and Saturday nights, which are some of the most risky nights for young men and women in the right age group, 12 to 17 years old, uh, and offer them a safe place to be with good mentoring and opportunity to socialize with uh, boys and girls from their neighborhood uh, who they otherwise might not know, that's going to help keep them on a productive, forward-moving path and out of trouble. So what we did in the DA's office is we started by our partnership with the Police Athletic League, which, with which we has, have historically had a strong partnership. And we use Central Harlem as our first location. We take money that we have seized from drug cases, and that has been forfeited lawfully to our office. And we have funded this sports programming using those drug proceeds. It's like turning... Uh, guns into plowshares or, or swords into plowshares. So in other words, we're turning good money and bad money into good money. Turning bad yes. money into good money. Yes. And we uh, key is to have excellent programming. And so we hired a first-rate group of basketball trainers called Pro Hoops who train the pros, the guys you see on TV. And if you, when your son gets to be high school senior and you have mm -hmm. lots of money, this is the group that you'd use to help him up his game to get into a college and play. But on Saturday and Friday nights in a gym that had previously been closed in Harlem on weekends because it didn't have the money, 
We now have that open. We have about 200 kids who for the last four months have been participating. We took that same model and moved it to the Lower East Side. We now have a similar program at the Henry Street Settlement. Ten days ago, we opened one in East Harlem at Johnson Houses. And this spring, we're going to go to Washington Heights. So our hope is by the end of this year, we'll have between six and 800 boys and girls on Friday and Saturday nights getting extraordinarily high-quality programming uh, to be there with their families, uh, to learn that law enforcement can be a positive influence in their lives. Some of the coaches are assistant DAs, volunteer coaches are assistant prosecutors as well as police officers. And I can tell you, because I spent a lot of time at these clinics, the kids love it. The parents are appreciative. We hope to be able to also add on educational and other uh, programming and opportunities that we can provide to the kids as, a, as an additive uh, while we have access to them and their families. And that's just a straight up example of, look, we, you care about making sure kids don't get into trouble as m more, frankly, uh, you'd prefer that right. than actually having them in a courthouse. I'd rather sit in the back seat or the back bleacher of a gym than in the back row of a courthouse watching a sentencing. That's gonna make our neighborhood safer it's better for the kids, and it's not, that's why we're so committed to it. That's all the time we have for this segment. Our very special guest was Cyrus Vance, Jr., Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you for coming by. Thank again. you, Greg. Good to see you. Okay.